Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our webinar, JTAG DFT Guidelines for Circuit Board Designers. My name is Bob Dibner. I'm a technical marketing engineer here at Corellis. Our presenter today will be Ryan Jones, but first I'd like to uh, go over our agenda. A quick note first, we will be using meeting software that allows for participants to speak, but we ask that you please remain muted during the webinar to avoid disruption. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the GoToMeeting chat function to send your questions to me. At the end of the session, after the presentation, uh, we'll try to address as many questions as possible in the time allotted. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our company, and then I'll explain the fundamentals of JTAG testing. Uh, or sorry, Ryan will explain the fundamentals of JTAG testing and general best practices related to designing JTAG into a system. Uh, we'll present guidelines for improving design for testability uh, during schematic design, as well as tips for layout design. And finally, as I mentioned, we'll close the webinar with a question and answer session. A little bit of background on Corellis. Uh, Corellis was founded in 1991 with headquarters in Cerritos, California. At Corellis, we focus on board and system level test uh, products and services, mostly related to IEEE 1149.1 standard as well as its related standards. Our parent company, Electronic Warfare Associates, or EWA, was founded in 1977 and acquired Corellis in 2006. EWA provides a variety of products and services. Uh, they target the intelligence agencies, Department of Defense, law enforcement, and more. Here at Corellis, we have four main business segments. Uh, first, we specialize in JTAG test and in-system programming applications, which is what we'll be covering in this session. Uh, we provide engineering services, such as boundary scan test development and design for testability review. Again, a concept that we're going to talk about during this session. Uh, we offer serial bus analyzer and exerciser products, most notably for I squared C and spy buses. And finally, we offer a line of Blackhawk JTAG emulation products for Texas Instruments microprocessors. Now, because JTAG is pretty much ubiquitous in modern digital electronics, our products and services are used in a wide variety of uh, electronics-related industries. So JTAG is used in telecommunications, aerospace and defense, medical uh, contract manufacturing, network and storage, industrial and automotive applications. Our presenter today will be Ryan Jones. Uh, Ryan's a senior technical marketing engineer here at Corellis. Ryan brings more than 20 years of experience with test equipment uh, with a focus on design for test and test procedure development. Ryan holds a Bachelor of Science degree from compu in uh, Computer Engineering Technology from Cal State University, Long Beach. And with that, I'd like to turn control over to Ryan. Great, thank you, Bob. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Um, I'm Ryan Jones, and I'll start the uh, presentation here on DFT guidelines for JTAG uh, testing when it comes to uh, designing the circuit boards. So before I begin on the DFT topics, I'd first like to briefly cover what JTAG is and, and how it came about. So JTAG is also known as boundary scan, and it refers to the IEEE 1149.1 standard. Uh, that standard was primarily developed to assist in detecting manufacturing defects. Uh, the acronym JTAG uh, stands for Joint Test Action Group. That was a body of uh, companies and individuals that developed the standard. Um, the standard is used primarily by chip manufacturers to uh, insert boundary scan logic into their chips and it's used by test vendors such as Corellis to build tools that access that logic. So the standard was developed during the late 80s um, and it was officially standardized in 1990. Uh, the BSDL language that was added in 1994 and there's been some other updates along the way. The most recent uh, revision of the standard is, uh, was made in 2013. The standard is available for purchase uh, on the uh, IEEE website if you're ever interested in uh, checking it out. So the architecture behind JTAG is uh, shown on the right here, uh, the, the basic architectural diagram. You have a, a device that has uh, core functional logic, uh, whatever you know that device was intended to do without JTAG functions, and then JTAG uh, the uh, the circuitry gets added around that core logic. 
So um, the 12 squares that you see here that surround the core logic is are called boundary scan cells. Uh, the total number of cells that make up this uh, this uh, chain is called the boundary scan register. The cells essentially provide uh, access to physical pins of the device, which our test tools can take advantage of to drive and receive test vectors. So each device is, is different in terms of what registers are available and the length of each register, but the fun fundamental control circuitry to access the JTAG logic is consistent among all the different devices. Um, so essentially you can, we can use the, uh, the register here to drive <clears throat> ones and zeros uh, binary logic in and then apply that data to the device pin. So we can use each, each uh, pin on a device effectively becomes your test point. Um, the JTAG logic is just basically inserted into the device and it can be used for a wide variety of applications. Like I said earlier, the, the primary application was for manufacturing tests uh, and detecting manufacturing faults. Uh, however, other applications have uh, come about uh, because the JTAG port is just um, uh, an easy access uh, physical layer that allows you to do a lot of different things. So, for example, device identification is one thing uh, that you can use. The latest uh, IEEE standard uh, pertaining to the 2013 changes added the uh, ESID electronic ID. Uh, so you can actually insert unique characteristics of a, um, a chip and you can read out that data from the scan chain. Interconnect testing is, is the, was the primary application. In-system programming has also become popular. You're able to actually program flashes, CPLD devices that are uh, attached uh, to JTAG logic. Functional testing. So non-boundary scan devices that are actually connected and surrounded by boundary scan devices can be accessed by uh, manipulating the pins of the boundary scan device to control those non-boundary scan devices. Uh, core logic testing, built-in self-test. Uh, typically, uh, a chip manufacturer may include a built-in self-test, which can be accessible through an opcode uh, using the, uh, the scan chain. And on-chip debug or emulation has been popular where the JTAG port is the primary access mechanism to, uh, to access the emulation features of a particular CPU. So why do, we, why do we need this standard? Well, it's primarily due to the loss of physical access on the circuit boards for testing. So traditional test equipment like scopes, analyzers, and in-system in-circuit testers rely on physical probes to connect to test points on the circuit board. However, as the boards have gotten smaller, denser, and faster, the ability to place these test points on a circuit board has become a major issue. So there's just often not enough real estate on the boards to place test points. Additionally, IC packages like BGAs have made it much harder to externally access device pins and therefore um, you're not able to uh, access the pin using those probes as well. Uh, additionally, as operating fre frequencies have gotten into the megahertz and gigahertz ranges, uh, test points can no longer even be placed on these signals, so that poses another issue. So just to reiterate, uh, loss of physical access is the primary reason why JTAG is important today. So this loss of physical access is a result of packaging restrictions, increased board density and high-speed signals. Uh, additional board complexities such as technology miniaturization, dual-sided component placement, blind and buried vias, multi-core chips, multi-chip modules, uh, system-on-chip components, 3D stack dies. These are all adding to the la layers of complexity and why access, physical access is becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, there's a constant drive to shorten product life cycle. JTAG provides ease of access, which helps address that constant drive to sh shorten those life cycles. And, and because of the access limitations, the value of using uh, external probe-based test equipment is diminishing. So because you can't, you can no longer utilize uh, these probes um, to access test points, 
um, you know, these these machines can't do the job that they were um, designed to do. So what are the benefits that you get when uh, adding JTAG to your board? So JTAG provides you the test capability uh, for interconnect tests on a PCB without the need for physical probes or test fixtures. It doesn't require the board to be in a bootable state for fault diagnostics. So the board doesn't have to even be functional uh, to access the JTAG, uh, the JTAG connection. And then JTAG allows more economical and system programming of devices such as flashes, CPLDs, FPJs, and server EEPROMs, as well as the other benefits such as the, the emulation access. So now we'll get into the de design for test uh, topics. Uh, the first uh, area we'll discuss is schematic design considerations. Um, and the four topics listed here, JTAG device selection, scan chain design, tap access port interface, and board level design for test. So when it comes to selection, device selection, uh, many vendors out there already support the IEEE 1149.1 standard. And like I said earlier, the standard uh, was originally released in 1990. So it's a very mature standard. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's gotten better over the years. Um, so the problems that we faced early on in the last 20 years are no longer our problems today. So uh, when you select a device that has IEEE 1149.01, um, usually it's been thoroughly tested by one or more of the major tool vendors out there. Um, so when you're selecting device devices that have JTAG, you want to look at the component data sheet to indicate their IEEE 1149.01 compliance. You can also look for the PIN names such as TCK, TMS, TDO, TDI, these are all the signal names for the JTAG pins. And, and that's usually an indicator that your device is JTAG compatible. You also want to ensure the device has a BSDL file available. The, bound, the BSDL file stands for Boundary Scan Description Language. This is the file that defines all the architecture of what's accessible by the tool vendors. So without the BSDL file, um, the tool uh, tools that generate the vectors can't really do their job effectively because we need to know what cells are available to communicate with the device. This isn't usually a problem when it comes to devices that have been on the market for a while, but if you're selecting newer devices that are just becoming available, sometimes the, there's a lag between when the device is available and when the BSDL file is available. Uh, more JTAG devices translates to greater J overall JTAG test coverage. So if you have the option of choosing a non-JTAG device versus a JTAG device, uh, you're going to be better off choosing the JTAG device from a JTAG testability point of view. Uh, now we'll talk about scan chain design. So the scan chain of your board is probably the most important piece in allowing JTAG access. Maximum testability is achieved when all JTAG devices are in a single chain. And, and we're talking from the standpoint of interconnect type testing. So you, when you put all your devices into a single chain, and what we mean by that is each device has a TDI, TDO pin, a TMS, and a TCK pin. So each device will connect from one to another using its TDI, TDO interface. So the TDO of the first device connects to the TDI of the second device, TDO of the second device connects to the TDI of the third device, and so on down the line. The TMS and the TCK signals are all uh, routed in parallel to devices uh, since the tools actually communicate with all these devices simultaneously. So the TCK and the, the TMS you can think of as, as broadcast signals. Um, and the reason that we want everything to be in a single chain is because the test vectors are driven simultaneously on all the device I.O. pins. So if you have interconnectivity between, for example, here U3 and U10, there's going to be some nets that are connected in between these devices. And similarly, you might have interconnectivity between U1 and U12. Well, when we're driving, when we're shifting in all the data, we shift in all the data to the boundary scan register, and then we apply that data to all the pins simultaneously. And so all the vectors are driven from each of the pins 
uh, simultaneously and then they're received on the other devices simultaneously. Now, even though we need everything to be in a single scan chain for interconnect style testing, often there's design restrictions that don't allow you to do that. Uh, for example, the, the most common case would be different voltage level interface. So you might have IO, voltage IO pins on a set of devices that are 1.8 volt, another set of devices have 2.5 volt IO, and another set of devices have 3.3 volt IO. Obviously, without logic uh, shifting uh, or voltage level translation circuitry, you're not going to be able to connect all the devices up together into a single scan chain. So one of uh, the things that our JTAG controllers do is have multiple taps on it, and each tap allows you to select a different voltage to it. So it is completely possible for you, the designer, to break up uh, scan chains uh, based on voltage level or, or and other restrictions, uh, and then connect each one of the taps up to a separate port on our boxes. And then this box, will effectively put each of these three separate taps into a single scan chain. So it will concatenate all these three scan chains for the purpose of test vector development and test vector execution. You can also uh, chain um, scan chains together using cables or fixtures. Just keep in mind that your signal reliability may suffer because you may have long cable lengths or inefficient grounding. <clears throat> uh, you also want to check the devices for full JTAG compliance. Um, check if the BSDL file has been tool validated. Uh, often, if you open up these BSDL files, there'll be comments in them, um, and some of them will indicate that this BSDL file has been validated with uh, Corellis tool or one of the other tool vendors out there. So it's always a good idea to make sure that the BSDL file has actually been verified by the chip manufacturer. And these, uh, these BSDL files are available from the chip manufacturer's websites. Typically, uh, a handful of, of vendors out there require you to sign an NDA to access the information. You also want to check for any non-standard behavior in uh, for the boundary scan devices. So this information may come from the data sheets, device errata, and BSDL files. So this just means that there might be exceptions uh, to IEEE compliance. For example, some devices may support emulation only or in-system programming only. They might not have a boundary scan register to perform interconnect type testing. Uh, some devices have MUX JTAG pins, so the devices can be used, uh, the pins can be used for JTAG, but they also serve some other functions. So as designers, it's important for you to make sure that your board can um, change the function of that pin as needed. The test engineers are going to obviously need it uh, to be used in the JTAG board, um, whereas uh, during normal functional operation, you're going to utilize the non-JTAG aspects of the pin. Uh, some devices require complex initialization sequences. Um, so uh, you might need to uh, be aware that uh, you may need to uh, introduce a lot of I'm getting a lot of feedback here, Bob. Can you make sure everybody's muted? It looks like everybody's muted, but uh, I'll go ahead and manually mute everybody. Okay, thanks. Um, some devices might require a complex initialization sequence, so it's important that as a design engineer that you be able to uh, you uh, to go through that initialization sequence to set up the devices accordingly. Uh, multiple scan chains, like I said, can be grouped by I.O. voltage levels, and the Corellis multi-tap controllers allow independent voltage control of each tap interface. You also want to consider your signal loading on your TMS and TCK signals. Uh, like I said earlier, all these signals are should be routed in parallel to all the JTAG devices. Um, however, if your um, 
using like our Corellis controller to drive the T TCK and TMS, uh, our TAP controllers can only drive up to six devices under load. So keep that in mind. If you, if you have more than six devices, you want to ensure that um, the uh, the signals can be um, can be driven properly. And then you don't want to connect your T reset signals to ground. Uh, ideally, uh, if you need to hold your TMS T reset pin low, you want to uh, use a pull down resistor instead of dying it directly to ground. Some devices out there uh, require the T reset signal to be low for normal functional operation. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Your test engineers need to be able to keep the T reset pin high to utilize the JTAG circuit because if the T reset pin goes low, uh, the JTAG tap controller on each of these devices is not accessible. Uh, ideally, you want to dedicate a schematic page for a block diagram uh, of the JTAG chain. Your test engineers will definitely uh, love you for it. Um, but using a schematic page for a block diagram gives you uh, gives the test engineers a, a a good bird's eye view of what the scan chain looks like, what the scan chain should be, and what devices are connected up to those. JTAG devices. So it allows them to implement their test procedures a lot easier. Now we'll go over the TAP interface connector. So the TAP interface connector is the interface between the Corellis controller and the unit under test. A solid ground connection is very important for reliability of your test procedures and test vector execution. Uh, Corellis utilizes 20-pin uh, headers, uh, and it provides ground between the JTAG control and the UUT. So every other JTAG pin is grounded to improve signal integrity and noise immunity. So when you build a ribbon cable, uh, every other pin on that ribbon cable is going to be uh, ground pin, and therefore it helps improve your signal integrity. Ideally, you want to use termination resistors on your TAP uh, pins, your JTAG pins, TDI, TMS, T TRST, and TCK. We recommend a minimum of 1K, but obviously it's going to be design dependent on what's best for, for your given design. But uh, 1K is the minimum if, you're, if you don't currently have any, um, any type of termination utilized. And if you add a 33 ohm series damping resistor on the last devices of the TDO, uh, that's going to help um, with overshoot and undershoot on the, uh, the TDO line. Most vendors use, utilize a standard 0.1 by 0.1 inch pitch header for their JTAG controllers. So ideally, um, if, you, if you have the real estate to put a one-to-one -one pin interface on your board, that's going to give you the easiest interface mechanism. But we realize that um, this isn't always going to be the case. So you just keep, keep in mind that you may have to create a adapter cable. And the, uh, the adapter cable needs to have a, a decent ground uh, between the, the cable and our header. And we always recommend to use shrouded headers to prevent incorrect insertion because some tap uh, some tap to utilize like a, a VTC pin or a power pin, and that's going to going to uh, harm possibly harm your uh, your JTAG pins if you accidentally connect it to power. So here's a diagram of what our uh, connector looks like. This is a 20 pin interface. The first 10 pins are going to be your JTAG pins intertwined with the ground pins. So you can see each of the even numbered pins are ground and the uh, the first, uh, the, uh, even, uh, the odd numbered pins are the JTAG signals. The last 10 pins are general purpose I.O. pins that can be used for various functionality. Um, they do have specific purposes when it comes to programming operations, 
but in general they can be used for uh, anything you the user chooses to use them for. So one of the things that we like to preach here at Corellis is to design JTAG into the product and not as an afterthought. Uh, we see time and time again where there's uh, companies out there that you know they treat design and test completely separate separate and so when the design engineers are finished with their product they just basically throw it over the wall to the test engineers and it's up to the test engineers to uh, get things working but you know that may have worked in the old days when accessibility wasn't so much of an issue but because accessibility is such a, a huge issue nowadays uh, it's important to uh, provide the test engineers with uh, as much JTAG access as possible so that they can do their job uh, well. So the design engineer, engineers ideally should plan ahead for, for testing. So you want to research, study DFT concepts, guidelines, and utilize those guidelines prior to and during board layout. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why you're attending this webinar. Uh, as a designer, you want to consider the initial power-up initialization and the board reset states uh, because the, the JTAG chain needs to be accessible during all these states if possible. Uh, you want to ensure the scan chain is operational when the board is applied. The T reset pin must be high for JTAG testing. So even though your uh, chip uh, says the T reset pin needs to be low for functional, uh, for normal operation, uh, for, from a test point of view, the T-reset pin needs to be uh, driven high. And so you need to allow your test engineers to have access to bring that pin high if they need to bring it high. Uh, ensure your devices can be placed in a boundary scan mode. So when you have MUX pins, you know, you want to give your uh, test engineers access to be able to uh, change the pin MUX to the JTAG operation. Properly terminate and allow test control of your J device uh, compliance pins. We'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, JTAG compatible programmable logic devices that control circuitry or scan chain paths must remain functional. So some some designers actually utilize a CPLD or an FPGA to route the scan chain through it. Keep in mind that if you do that, the CPLDs and the, and the FPGAs are going to be JTAG devices. Now, when you're routing uh, JTAG signals, JTAG signals through the actual operational or core logic of the device, you're basically removing the test capability of that device. So uh, to maintain their scan chain, those devices are going to have to remain in bypass. Ideally, you don't want to use... Uh, CPLDs or uh, FPGAs to route your uh, power circuitry or um, your scan chain paths uh, to keep them uh, fully testable with JTAG. And then constraints can't be used if the scan chain isn't working. So with uh, with our tools, you can use you know fixed high and fixed low constraints during test vector development to keep certain nets high and low but you can't actually use a constraint if the scan chain isn't working so it's a it's a chicken and the egg problem okay we'll talk about compliance pins compliance enable pins so the compliance enable pin is essentially these are identified in the VSTL file and they basically determine that these are pins that must be maintained at a specific level at all times uh, prior to and during testing uh, to make sure that the JTAG operation uh, works correctly. So for example, uh, Xilinx Kintech part uh, has a attribute called compliance patterns in the uh, BSDL file and the compliance pattern attribute lists the pins that are considered compliance enable pins in the state that that pin needs to be in for the device to remain boundary scan compliant. So what this says is the program pin has to be high at all times in order for um, JTAG testing to work on this part. So as a designer you need to be aware of this fact and these pins must be held at the proper state while the board is being tested. 
Now on your board, you're also going to have other non-JTAG devices on it. So ideally, if you can, you want to allow JTAG control over non-JTAG devices. So a good example is shown here, where on the left we have a clock oscillator that where its enable pin is tied to ground. And so because of that, the clock's always enabled and therefore the pins that it's connecting to, the boundary scan devices, these, these pins cannot be tested using boundary scan because it's going to interfere with the enabled clock source. Uh, on the right, we have a workaround where we can take one of the boundary scan pins on one of the devices, connect it up to the enable pin so that we can drive this pin to be disabled while we're doing JTAG testing. So ideally, if you can uh, take advantage of situations where you can use boundary scan to control enable pins on your non-JTAG devices, that's going to increase your testability of the board. Uh, memory cluster testing. So memories are typically non-JTAG parts that, when surrounded by JTAG logic, can be tested. So as long as you have boundary scan control over all the control address and data buses on your memory, including the clock, uh, we can basically simulate reads and writes to the, uh, the memory device and therefore test it. And this gives you actually additional test coverage. For example, if, this, if the boundary scan device was your only device connected up to the memory and there wasn't any other boundary scan devices connected to it, uh, under normal situations, this bound, these pins would only be tested for shorts. But because we can communicate with the memory, uh, the boundary scan pins and the memory pins uh, become tested for opens as well. So additional considerations for memory cluster testing. Uh, the driving JTAG devices must have a separate control cell for the address and the data control buses. Uh, this is fairly um, uh, uncommon, but some devices have shared control cells, which uh, make memory testing impossible in those scenarios. There's a handful of devices that have sh shared control cells. Um, this is uh, not common, say, for example, with programmable logic devices. Typically, each pin on a, on a FPGA or CPLD has a separate control cell, so you won't run into this issue. But the BSDL file contains control cell information. So um, typically what you're going to do is run uh, uh, the test vector development process through a uh, Corellis tool or another tool, and it's going to tell you whether you have full control over the device pins that connect up to the memory or not. Um, Pins, are, pins can be defined as linkage bits in the BSDL file as well, and these pins have no control. So some of the more popular ones uh, that would have no JTAG control are like power pins. But then there's also I.O. pins that may be defined as linkage bits. Um, there are cases where some CPUs have linkage bits for the, the clock that's, uh, that connects up to your memory devices. In, it, in these cases, you're not going to be able to test your uh, memory device in that situation because you don't have JTAG control over that clock pin. If a PLL is used to drive the clock, you want to ensure that PLL has a bypass feature uh, that can be bypassed during JTAG testing. <clears throat> now, we've tested uh, memories as simple as uh, normal SRAM devices all the way up to DDR4 memories. So, um, the clock, the, the clock speed that you're using to uh, actually test these memories is not so important, but PLLs tend to have a minimum frequency that they need to lock onto, and that's where the issue comes into play. Alternatively, if you don't, if you can't actually test the memory with a normal JTAG uh, type of a test, you can uh, functionally test these at speed if they are connected to a, uh, a CPU supporting uh, JTAG and testing, uh, and this would be considered our ScanExpress JET product. For uh, flash in system programming, uh, it's very similar in regards to uh, memory testing where you have a, a typical, um, you have a 
device that is connected up to boundary scan pins. It's a non-JTAG device. And uh, the JTAG devices drive the flash device uh, by simulating commands to it. Um, the primary uh, thing with flash programming that people tend to latch onto is the speed of flash. Um, to reduce your programming times, uh, you want to maximize your T-clock rates. Uh, you want to ensure your scan chain is as short as possible. The shorter your scan chain length, the faster we're able to shift in that data, and therefore it speeds up the, the time that it that uh, we can program the flashes. Uh, you want to remove any unnecessary constraints, which may not be needed for the flash program. And sometimes you have constraints that are used for like interconnect and testing and memory tests that are not necessary for constraints. Constraints may may put devices uh, into a non-bypass mode, which means they're in the scan chain, uh, or the boundary scan register is in the scan chain, which makes the scan chain longer. So if you remove un unnecessary constraints, it has a chance of reducing your overall scan chain length. And then there's also a GPIO signal that can be used. The external right strobe um, can be tied directly to the flash device to sp help speed up uh, programming times. So on our tap connector, pin 11 is called the external right strobe. If you connect this pin directly to your flash memory device, uh, we can basically strobe that from the I.O. pin as opposed to scanning it. And that can save uh, a, a full cycle of scans. It uh, Because if we don't have this uh, I.O., we'll have to simulate the right enable pin through scanning. So we have to drive it low and then high, and that takes two full scans. So if we don't have to do f two full scans, we can just um, control it with that I.O. pin. You can calculate your theoretical flash programming times by using a simple formula. So you take the number of bits in your scan chain, and this includes uh, devices that may or may not be in bypass. You take that by the number of scans per write. This is typically going to be two uh, because, like I said, you need to simulate the write enable pin going from low to high. So if you use the external write strobe, this would become a one. Um, you take that and multiply that by the number of writes per location. This is going to be flash device dependent, depending on the, the data sheet. It's going to tell you how many cycles you need to program each location. And then you multiply that by the number of locations, divide that by the t clock frequency, you'll get a number in seconds. And that, sh that should be the number of seconds that it takes to program the amount of data that you specified. If you have FPGAs or other programmable logic on your board, there are certain considerations that you uh, want to take into account. Uh, so FPGA devices have different test characteristics depending on whether the devices are configured or not. So the generic BSDL file provided by the chip manufacturer is used for pre-configuration state testing. Uh, if you want to test with the FPGA in a configured state, uh, a post-configuration BSDL file must be generated by the FPGA tool. Um, and I'm not going to go through that process here, but just keep in mind that if you want to test with the FPGA configured, you're going to have to generate a file with its tool and use that BSDL file during the test vector generation process. Uh, if you want to test the parts in a pre-configuration state, um, the Xilinx parts have an IP pin, uh, the Intel which was Altera parts, have an nconfig pin. If these pins are held low prior to and power and during power up of the target, it's going to inhibit the configuration of the parts. Um, so I guess maybe about 10 to 20 years ago, we always used to recommend people test in the pre-configuration state. But as uh, functionality and, and capabilities of F FPGAs have evolved over the years, it's become more and more uh, pra practical to test in the post configuration state just because there's a lot of different voltage levels come into play, there's differential signaling, there's um, 
uh, stuff like termination, um, uh, impedance matching. There's a lot of different features that uh, where the device actually has to be configured to employ these different functions. So it's just something to, to keep in mind as a designer. Do you, uh, do you need to configure the device for testing or not? And then if you choose to uh, keep it in the pre-configuration state, one of the um, ways you can go about doing this is routing your init or end config pin directly to the tap port, the JTAG port on your board. And so when you plug in the cable, uh, the cable is going to ground this pin for you for the test engineer, so he doesn't have to worry about it. Okay, now we'll jump into uh, the PCB layout considerations. Some of the different things we'll talk about here. Uh, so some of the general considerations, uh, TCK needs to be as free as possible of glitches and spikes. Uh, you wanna treat TCK as a, a critical high-speed clock signal during the layout process. So you, you should tag it as a critical net. Uh, first pass net. If you're using fan out buffers to distribute the TCK and TMS signals, place the termination, sorry, place the termination resistors on the primary side of the buffer. And that's the signals coming from the JTAG controller. Uh, the TDO connection of the last device in the scan chain should be as short as possible to the tap connector. And the, uh, ideally you wanna put a series damping resistor on the TDO of the last pin um, as close as possible to that device's TDO pin. You want to keep your tap connector uh, away from noisy analog components, such as voltage regulators. Um, we've seen a lot of cases where if you, if you have a JTAG connector that's located near noisy components, uh, it's, go it's going to affect the reliability of your tests, and it's going to inject a lot of noise into your test vectors, and it's going to give you a lot of errors that you don't want happening, and it may even prevent um, you know, reliable testing altogether. You want to provide adequate room around the tap connector to be able to plug cables in uh, after the product is fully enclosed or assembled. So just keep in mind that uh, you want to be able to access the JTAG port um, after things are out in the field, for example. Uh, consider test point access to probe the scan chain when things don't work. Because the scan chain is the most important piece of JTAG testing, without a working scan chain, you can't do any JTAG applications. And so uh, debugging a scan chain is very important when it doesn't work. And giving access to actually debug the scan chain is equally important. Uh, scan chain debug is the easiest when the JTAG termination resistors are placed closest to the tap connector along with clearly labeled ground points. So if you can not only uh, provide the termination resistors close to the tap connector, label them with a silk screen uh, and give your test engineers uh, test points to ground. And that's one thing I actually I don't see um, too many designs that <clears throat> provide good ground connections. So oftentimes test engineers have to, you know, stick a, a probe on a, a very small capacitor or something to, to utilize as a ground point. Uh, it's, it's very convenient if you have a, a test point that is located to ground so that you can use that as a reference for your uh, other debug efforts. <clears throat> We have a recommended list of general layout guidelines. Uh, many of these are um, have been around a while, but they're still relevant. Uh, several um, application notes from Altera, analog devices. So if you uh, if you uh, have a moment, you can take a look at them. And uh, these are you know good practices in general. The TMS and TCK are broadcast lines. They should be routed accordingly. Uh, to high-speed frequency bus rules. We recommend the, uh, the JTAG traces be a minimum 10 mil with 10 mil spacing. Um, if you can route the JTAG signals on the outer layers away from noisy analog voltage regulators, that's also going to uh, allow you to access the signals in case there are issues with the scan chain during bring up of the board. Um, signal quality, like I said, is, is a very key factor for successful JTAG testing. Uh, 
So your JTAG signals, you want to uh, uh, route them as critical nets. The most common problems are reflections and ringing on the TCK. Termination is very important. Routing is important. Uh, while we don't have necessarily a ideal method of routing, you can use point-to-point, uh, -point, you can use a star topology. Uh, it's really design dependent, design specific on how you want to implement your T-clock routing. Um, but just keep in mind that um, successful JTAG testing is dependent on uh, no uh, noise-related issues or a clean T-clock signal. Test points. Uh, you want to make sure your compliance enable pins that we talked about are accessible in case the test engineer needs to apply them in the opposite direction to what uh, normal operation would be. Uh, so uh, you might consider placing pads for pull-up, pull-down resistors on the pin if you're, if you're not sure. And then even though TDI, TDO are point-to-point, -point, consider an accessible test point to each link to debug if necessary. Um, sometimes you might have an issue where you have an interconnect between a TDI and TDO signal that's between two BGA parts, and if you don't have accessibility to them, um, it's going to be very difficult to troubleshoot that. And then convenient test locations for ground, which I already covered. So I want to kind of talk about Corellis DFT services. We offer a complete range of turnkey services. You know, we've covered a lot of territory here, and, and you know, we, we only have a finite amount of time to do this webinar. Um, and we only covered maybe a small, uh, several different factors when it comes to DFT uh, for JTAG testing. Uh, we do a lot of DFT services here at Corellis, so um, you're more than welcome to access our services uh, if you need assistance um, and, you, you know, you just you don't have the bandwidth or you don't feel confident in your expertise in the area. It's uh, certainly something that we can help assist you with. So if you use our services, we'll do a full design for test analysis on your board. You'll send us the design files, your netless schematic. We'll review those design files. We'll give you a test coverage analysis report that gives you what the level of test coverage you should expect when doing JTAG. We'll give you additional details on how, you, how we think you can improve testability. Um, and if you do this prior to your board layout, it's going to give you a lot of uh, good feedback on ways that you can improve your design uh, before you make commitments uh, after layout. We also have regular training classes at our headquarters in Cerritos. These are offered at no charge to you. Um, we have them uh, typically monthly, sometimes uh, every other month. And then it, there's plenty of other education on our website. Uh, we have a DFT guidelines and uh, application note for JTAG testing, white paper that's available on our website, as well as uh, other materials as well. So feel free to browse our website and take advantage of the information that uh, we make available to you. And in closing, I'd like to basically say that our core philosophy at Corellis is to provide solutions and not just products. We treat our customer relationships as important as the products we sell. Um, and we're here to make you succeed. Uh, so don't hesitate to uh, contact us if you have any questions or need help along the way. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob and uh, see if we have any questions and answers from the group. And thank you all for attending. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, again, for those in the audience, please feel free to use the chat box to send your questions to me, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we have about 11 minutes here. Uh, just to let you know, we will be providing the presentation slides to all registrants and an email afterward. Uh, I'll also include a link to our DFT guidelines white paper that Ryan just mentioned. And uh, assuming the recording turns out well, uh, sometimes we have some technical difficulties, uh, we should be able to provide a recording of the webinar session to you uh, for those who weren't able to attend or if you'd like to share it with uh, some colleagues. Uh, so to get to some questions, uh, we did have some questions that were asked during the presentation. Uh, one of them is uh, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that some devices require a complex initialization sequence. Uh, do you have an example of such initialization sequence, Ryan? Uh, 
Um, I don't know the particular um, manufacturer, but yeah, there's um, certain parts that require uh, a specific number of, of T-clock sequences uh, or, or T-clock um, transitions before the JTAG port is, is ready to be accessed. Okay. Uh, any other examples yeah. or? Uh, that's that's the one that comes to jumps out at me. Okay. Uh, another question we had: uh, Do you have any design tips for making sure AC coupled nets are testable? Um, so AC coupled nets, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, JTAG is a is a DC uh, uh, test, so uh, testing through AC circuits is isn't really possible. Um, they did uh, introduce 1149.6, which uh, has to do specifically with AC coupled testing. Uh, so uh, if you can choose a device that has .6 compatibility, that's going to give you um, the best chance of being able to test uh, AC coupled signals. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, some FPGAs have two internal chains. Uh, are there any special DFT considerations for these devices? Um, two internal chains. I haven't actually experienced that one. Well, uh, I actually have some experience with that one, so if you don't mind, I can field that. Sure. So a lot of uh, modern uh, FPGAs, you'll have like a, uh, it's a sock. It'll have a CPU core as well as the FPGA fabric. Uh, some examples would be like Cyclone 5 from Altera, now Intel FPGA, or a Zinc from Xilinx. Um, I'd say the special considerations are going to be per device. Uh, each vendor implements things slightly differently. Uh, your best bet is to contact us. Uh, I'll give you uh, my contact information after the presentation. Uh, I can... I have a whole page of uh, guidelines for Xilinx Zinc, for example, on uh, how to configure the chain best for boundary scan testing, or if you're doing uh, CPU testing, you're going to configure it differently. Uh, in general, you read the uh, guidelines from the manufacturer of the chip, and you figure out uh, what you want to be able to do if you're going to use boundary scan or some other JTAG-based uh, uh, test techniques, and go from there. But yeah, it, it's mostly uh, going to be vendor dependent because everybody implements it slightly differently. Okay, uh, we have another question right here. Uh, could you explain more about uh, running uh, at full speed FPGA uh, to test memory? So I, I think what that's asking is, uh, you know, do uh, at speed memory testing with an FPGA. Uh, is there something we can do there? Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, you can you can instantiate CPUs inside of an FPGA and take advantage of our Scan Express Jet functionality. Um, Yep. All right, I got a phone caller there that uh, is not muted, and I have no capability to mute them. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it's, I mean, I think through a CDW, it's not too much more expensive than everywhere else, but Good. Good. Um, to cover the 15 computers, it's just not well. Well, I apologize for that. Uh, wow. Yep, put it through. Yep, that works. All right. Excellent. Awesome. We're done with it. Great. Yeah. Would I lose him? Okay. Okay, so again, the, the question was, uh, if you have an FPGA, uh, can you use it to run full speed uh, memory tests? So, so yeah, I think I was saying that you can instantiate a CPU inside the FPGA uh, and, and utilize that with our Scan Express Jet tool to perform at speed testing of the memory. Um, and that's probably the the primary way that you're going to get get doing that at speed. Okay. Uh, another question: Are there any uh, JTAG security considerations that should be taken into account? So that's actually a tricky subject because uh, you know the JTAG chain is always available. Um, so you know during the design phase, during the production phase, out in the field, the J if, if you leave the JTAG on the board, 
uh, people are going to have access to it. So some device, some devices have uh, fuses uh, that you can actually blow to prevent access from the JTAG chain, but that means nobody's going to have access to that uh, ever in the future. Which you know maybe that's what you want. Uh, there's there's other devices out there that have a security code or sequence that you have to uh, send to the device to actually get access to the internal registers of the part. But yeah, security is a big issue, and it's it's becoming a bigger issue as time goes on. I, I think uh, there'll be more and more applications that address the security issues of JTAG. But right now we're still in, uh, it's still evolving. Okay, uh, thanks for that answer. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> another question we have is, um, is there anything to consider uh, when designing PS, uh, sorry, PCBs that'll be tested in an interconnected system? So that'd be like a, a system of, uh, you know, multiple PCBs that each have JTAG capability? Uh, yeah, so we have a product called Scan Express Merge. Um, which you know you can test two assemblies as a complete system. The only real design consideration there is that your JTAG testability is going to be limited to the interface between the two boards. So, uh, which is effectively the connectors or the connections between the, the two boards. So, as long as you have you know JTAG pins on one side of the connector on the first assembly and JTAG pins on the other side of the uh, the design with its connectors and you shouldn't have any issues with testing over that connector using JTAG. So beyond that there aren't a whole lot of design considerations uh, to, to worry about. Okay, uh, thanks for that answer Ryan. Uh, I think with that we'll go ahead and wrap things up. I wanted to mention again, we will be providing everybody who registered an email after this uh, session where we will provide you with uh, the slides that were presented, a recording of the session, as well as our uh, design for testability white paper. Uh, if you have any questions for us, I'll provide you with our uh, contact information, our telephone numbers, and our uh, email addresses. Uh, and I wanted to thank you, everybody, again, uh, for coming out or for listening to our webinar today. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.